We will just read the chapter, 2 Corinthians 3. I'll read from the King James and then I'll follow the Derby translation in the study. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excels. For if that which was done away with was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the re reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is the sp Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass or in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. So this is a wonderful chapter that speaks about Paul's ministry. And we have seen in chapter 1 how because of his ministry he was uh, in great sufferings. And he has explained how God allowed that to happen. God was working in Paul to prepare him to be a useful instrument for this ministry of the new covenant. We'll talk about the new covenant in a moment. And so he went through great trials in Ephesus when he was almost uh, feared he almost feared that he was going to be killed with this mass uprising. You can see that in Acts 19 in detail. And then he put his trust in the Lord in chapter 1, verse uh, 9. He says, God allowed this, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And he says then in verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So God allowed these tremendous difficulties in Paul's life so that he would really put his trust in God. And that is what we all need to do. Like Paul had been very successful, if I may use that term, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, we see how many people got saved in that area where he worked for three years. And then that uprising took place, and then he stayed a while after that, but then he uh, started to continue on his journey. But the point is, he had to put his trust in God, 
And if Paul had to learn that, we have to learn that. For all of us, we need to learn to put our trust in the Lord, not trust in self or trust in an organization or whatever it is, we need to put our trust in God. And that's what we learn from Paul. And then we have seen in the chapter 1 at the end a summary of his ministry that he is um, the representative of God and could say in verse 20 uh, that in him are yea and amen. All the promises of God are yea and amen in the Lord Jesus unto the glory of God by us because Paul was a minister and that's not the point Paul was a minister together with the other apostles of this wonderful message of grace and he explained then how uh, God is the one who put everyone on the right foundation we talked about it the last time in chapter 121 and how God has sealed us because of course Literally, this is Paul, but it applies to all the true believers. God has sealed us, put his seal on us. It's a guarantee that we'll reach the end destination. And we've seen the earnest of the Spirit. The earnest has two meanings, but we have seen that in chapter 122. It is uh, the enjoyment that we'll have already now of things that are still future, but through the Holy Spirit we may enjoy these blessings already now. And uh, at the same time, that goes together with sufferings. And we have seen in chapter 2 a little bit about that. But in these sufferings, Paul had learned to rejoice. There were great difficulties. Heaviness, he used that term in chapter 2, verse 1. And yet, he could rejoice. And so then we go uh, in chapter 2. We, we just summarize very briefly. It was... Uh, with many tears in verse 4 so these afflictions that he went through were allowed by God to prepare him to be the right kind of vessel and we will see that in chapter 3 in more detail and so he learned that his ability or sufficiency as the King James uses that he received that from God and so he really had two things. He trusted the Lord and he also had ability given by God to present this ministry. Um, now we have seen that in this context he speaks about the situation in Corinth where they had to discipline a brother. He was excommunicated and then Paul is uh, exhorting here the believers to for forgive because there was repentance and we'll see more about that in chapter 7 and to have the right attitude of love towards this brother, brother who was now uh, uh, repenting of his sin and so the discipline had an, a good effect but we'll see more about this in chapter 7 and so we have seen then how, it, how important it is if a brother has been restored that we should not hold grudges against him, because then we give Satan an advantage, verse 11. And so Paul was very concerned about the right condition of the uh, Corinthians, and that they would have the right attitude. And so Paul was very concerned because he did not know yet how they would respond to the first epistle. And so we talked about it a little bit the last time. And so he traveled on and he met uh, in Macedonia, he went to Macedonia and there he met then finally uh, Titus and so the closing verses of chapter 2 are important because here we see Paul as in victory uh, mentioned the last time this is uh, you see that in the Roman Empire that if a general had great victory then the victims those who were taken or the the, uh, the people have been taken captive would then be paraded in Rome and it would be for the honor of that general and so Paul applies that now to him that he is like in a march of triumph and to show the results that he had in his ministry uh, 
that Christ had given. And also we have seen how this uh, savor, in chapter 2, verse 15, this savor is, has two things. Those who uh, accept the message of the gospel, for them it is a sweet savor. But for those who are, who are not saved, who reject the gospel, it is a savor that, uh, that confirms that they are on the way to, be, to, to perish. And so the gospel has always those two aspects. Those who accept the gospel, they enjoy that sweet savor of Christ. But those who reject the gospel, they are under God's judgment. They are on the way to perish. And that same odor, that pleasantness of the gospel, is for them then uh, an odor of death. A very solemn in verse 16. And then he ends in verse 16 with this question, Who is sufficient to, for these things? So, who is able to minister this important message? And we'll see that ability comes from God. God gave him the ability, the sufficiency, to administer the message of the gospel. And I make a little application for all of us that we need to realize that in ourselves we have no ability. But God wants to give each believer abilities to do something for him. And all believers, not only here, but all the believers in principle have been sent into this world by the Lord to represent the Lord. And that, is, that applies for all of us. We are not of this world, but we are in this world. And now we belong to the Lord Jesus, who is now in heaven, and he leaves us here in this world, he sends us in this world as his representatives. Not to improve the world, but to present the gospel, as Paul was doing. And then he says, our sufficiency to do that, our ability to do that, comes from the Lord. It's not in myself. He had a tremendous education. You can find it in Philippians 3. But he did, he did not longer boast in that education, as he used to do when he was among the Jewish people, now he boasts in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 he, he explains that. And he says now that the sufficiency that he has to uh, work as this messenger is from the Lord. And we'll see more about that in chapter 3 and 4. And so it's important that he realized this message uh, can be corrupted. So it's not only that God made him, uh, gave him the ability to preach, but even to do it in the right way, that it would not uh, be a counterfeit, or that it would be in the right, uh, given in the right way. He relied on the Lord, in verse 17. It is of God. And so that's what we need to do. We need to rely on God. And that implies also that we rely on the Lord in the glory. Because the Lord Jesus, in heaven, He had called Saul of Tarsus, he had sent him on this mission. And so for us, that's the same. The Lord Jesus in heaven is the one who calls us and who has sent us in this world to be his representatives. And so we can uh, join Paul here that he would speak in the sight of God in Christ. That applies to Paul. That applies to us. We are in Christ, in the Anointed One. That's the relationship we have with God and through the Lord Jesus. And now we are in the presence of God. We represent the Lord Jesus. We represent God in this scene. And while that is true, I'm just saying, Paul brings then another question in chapter 3, where we start tonight, that he does not bring these details out to commend himself. He was um, enabled by God, and qualified by God, and so he didn't need to uh, commend himself for this ministry. God had commended him to that ministry and for that ministry and he had enabled him to do that ministry. He didn't have to put a pat on his back or uh, receive pats on the back from others. He didn't need any commendation to work there among the Corinthians because that is the context. What happened? Those believers in Corinth had come to know the Lord through the ministry of Paul. You can see that in Acts 18, in detail, he worked there for uh, at least one and a half years. And so that's why he says uh, in verse 2, 
ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Mm -hmm. So Paul was uh, here speaking about the results of his ministry, that these believers in Corinth were the fruit of his ministry, that God had worked, the Lord in the glory had worked, as I said earlier, in Paul, and all those believers together were like a letter written on his heart. He loved these believers, even though he had to uh, say strong words in the first epistle, he loved them. And so, that is, with, with children we have that sometimes we need to correct them, but we do it because we love them. And so Paul, when he had to uh, send this first epistle of correction, uh, he did that because he loved the believers. And the Lord had uh, enabled him for that ministry. And so he says, I don't need uh, letters of commendation to uh, show that I'm qualified. You are my epistle in our hearts and made known of all men. So that is something that is important for us. He is not relying on the commendation of man, but the fact that these believers, uh, that these people there had come to know the Lord through his ministry was a commendation in itself. And so Paul did not need other letters. What happened with people who came from uh, Jerusalem, with the false teachers, you see that especially in Galatia, they came with letters from Jerusalem to show that they had the weight of the, of the apostles in Jerusalem behind them. So that is why Paul uh, emphasizes here, he does not need letters from the apostles in Jerusalem. He's not putting them down, that's not his intention at all. But what he's saying here, he did not need letters from the apostles in Jerusalem, or later on in this epistle, see, he calls them super apostles, pe people who claim to be apostles. He didn't need letters from other people because the believers in Corinth were the confirmation of his ministry and he didn't need any uh, letters of commendation. That doesn't mean that Paul is t talking against letters of commendation. That would be a wrong conclusion. He's not talking uh, against letters of commendation. Uh, we see that in Acts 18, for example, when Paul was uh, back to Jerusalem and then Apollos came there from Egypt uh, and he learned through Aquila and Priscilla more of the truth and then after a while he wanted to go to Corinth and then they sent they gave a letter of commendation with Apollos so that he could travel to Corinth and there be received you see they did not know Apollos but with Paul they knew him from the beginning they were saved through his ministry so Paul didn't need letters of commendation but Apollos who went there from Ephesus to Corinth, he needed a letter of commendation. That makes sense, okay? So he's not talking against letter of commendation, but in his particular case, he did not need a letter for Corinth. That's the point. And so in verse 3 he says that being manifested to be Christ's epistle ministered by us. That sounds a little bit complicated. But this letter that was in Paul's heart and read by all men, everybody knew about Paul's ministry and the results there in Corinth. So the uh, epistle written by Christ was, and that's not the point, he's going to talk about the new covenant, so we'll talk about it in more detail a bit later. But the point here in verse 3 is that this letter that Paul is now speaking about, Christ's epistle, who was in Paul's heart, written by the Holy Spirit, uh, and also this letter represents all the believers in Corinth. So there is an interesting point here. Christ's epistle here was ministered by Paul, or by those who worked with him, but it is really an epistle that Christ in the glory had written, and it shows the unity of the believers. It's one epistle. It was not only in the heart of Paul, but it was made known, as we have seen in verse 2. And Christ's epistle is really a summary of the believers there in Corinth. 
together they were also an epistle to this world. So this epistle was in Paul's heart, the believers were in Paul's heart, the epistle was made known to the believers there, they knew Paul's ministry, and now they understood that this letter was written not with ink, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but by the Spirit of the living God. So Paul is not boasting in his own work here, he is emphasizing that God had been at work. He's emphasizing here, as I said earlier, Christ in heaven, through the Holy Spirit, had worked so that these people got saved, and they were in the heart of Paul, like an epistle, altogether they were in his heart, he cared for them, and now he says that this epistle is not written with ink. If you send a letter of commendation written by ink, that can be erased. But this epistle written by the Spirit of God, of the living God, cannot be erased. Okay? And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. And not on stone tables, but on fleshy tables of the heart. So now he's going to make a contrast between the Old Testament and this, uh, this new order of things. In the Old Testament, when God had given the law of Moses, uh, he gave two tables. And on those tables were written the, the Ten Commandments. And when Moses went down from the mount, in Exodus 32, you can see that, he saw from a distance how they were dancing around the golden calf. That was this in 40 days. In 40 days after Moses left them to go up to the mount to, to have communications with God, they got the instructions how the, uh, the um, tabernacle should be built. In the meantime, they had uh, put that uh, golden calf there, and they were dancing around it. And when Moses saw that, he smashed the two tables of the law, because if he would not have done that, God would have destroyed the whole nation in one moment. You can see the details in Exodus 32. But what he is saying now here, the ministry that Paul now had of grace, was not the ministry of the law that Moses had, and that resulted in death, and that's why we see later the letter kills, that's a reference to the Old Testament law, that would lead to death and condemnation, or condemnation and death. But this new order, this new um, setup by God, is not something that can be erased, like written on ink. It's not something that is written on stone, but it is something written by the Spirit of the living God. Now, the living God is... Uh, reference to God himself, the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God is one in three persons. The living God is a term we find 28 times in the Bible, 15 times in the Old Testament, 13 times in the New Testament. So there's four times, seven times you have a reference to the living God. This is the God who had written this letter in Paul's heart, but saved these people there in, uh, in Corinth. That was a result of a work of the spirit of the living God. That is a tremendous work. And if you compare that with the law, the law would lead to condemnation. But this new uh, administration, this new ministry that God gave to Paul, is a ministry of life, and you'll see that in a few moments. So why does he call this the ministry of the new covenant? If you find that later, See, the Old Covenant they're just talking about in verse uh, 7, the ministry of death. Because the law showed that people could not keep the law. They said, all that the Lord had said we will do. They had repeated that three times. And then the, that 40th day, they were all guilty of idolatry and other things. And so they were under God's condemnation and they would have been killed. So if Moses would not have smashed those tables, they would all have been killed. And then God gave instruction to Moses to go up to the mountain, and then he should bring two tables himself, and also an ark to put them in, 
and then God would write those on those tables uh, the law. You can see that in Deuteronomy 10. And so this is the contrast. The old covenant was written not by not by ink, but on stones of table. Even that new set that was stones of table, and there you have the law that God demanded. Now that law, in its uh, in its in its meaning, was in the heart of the Lord Jesus. You can find in Psalm 40 a reference that says that thy law is in my inward part, sometimes like in my heart, but that is where the law was. That law that nobody could keep, that law was intact in the Lord Jesus. He kept the law completely according to God's mind, uh, according to God's thoughts, but he was the only one who could do that. But the people, as we said so earlier, the people failed. They could not keep that law whatsoever. And so the reference we find here now, uh, the law written by the Spirit of the living God, is now a reference to the believers today. They are not under the law of Moses, but they are under a new order of things. You can call it a law, you can call it a covenant, there are many different expressions that can be used for this new order of things. And it is Christ written on the tablets of the heart of the believers. And it is uh, God, the living God, through the Holy Spirit, who has written on the believer's heart. Understand? The moment you come, become a believer, God is at work. God is writing. God is the great writer. It's amazing when you see that, how much emphasis there is on the living God, how he writes. And what does he write on the tablets of our heart? Christ. We'll see that in a few moments. He's, he's writing Christ. We are therefore, they are called Christ's epistle. It's Christ himself who is written on the tablets of the heart of the believers. Of course, that is in tune with the demands of the law of Moses, but not because we are under the law of Moses, we are under a new order of things. And in the new order of things, it's not a free for all, you can just do what you please. This new order of things is uh, really Christ expressed in the believers. So this new covenant for Israel that will take place in the future. You can, if you make a note, you read in Hebrews 8, you find how God, and that's a quote from Jeremiah uh, 31, says seven times, I will, I will, I will. God is going to introduce publicly that new covenant with Israel, and then the law will be written on their heart. Not the law written on tablets of stone, but it will be written on their heart. But the difference with believers today is, that the Spirit of the Living God, the Spirit that quickens, we will see that in verse 6, the Spirit of God is writing Christ on our hearts. And we'll, we'll come to that point in a few moments, at the end of the chapter 3. So to go back to verse 4 now, as we realize that Paul had received this ministry to uh, administer through the Holy Spirit, the gospel, so that it would have an effect on the heart of people, so that the spirit of the living God would write on people's heart. That is why we see in verse 3, Christ's epistle. So Christ is the writer, but is also the one written on the tablets of the heart. That's the point. So Christ himself is written on the tablets of the heart of the believer. That is the point here in verse 3. And that is why Paul had confidence in verse 4. Such confidence have we through the Christ. Because it's not only that Christ was the writer on the tablets of the believer's hearts. He is the person who administers this ministry. He is giving the sufficiency, the confidence to Paul to do that. And everything is through Christ. 
So Christ is written on the heart through the Holy Spirit, but also this whole ministry is through Christ. Christ means anointed one. He is now anointed in the glory, in heaven. And as I said earlier, from heaven, through the Holy Spirit, He is at work. When somebody gets saved today, it is through that ministry from heaven, through the Holy Spirit, that this, uh, uh, that this happens. And when we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is through a work of the Holy Spirit, but also through a work by Christ in heaven. So He is at work. And that writing is really what He is doing, but He is Himself the writer through the Holy Spirit on our hearts. And one more thing in that connection. He needs all the believers together. Christ is writing on all the believers together. And this epistle here in Corinth refers to the local believers in Corinth. But it's also true that all the believers together are like one epistle. Christ is written on all the believers. And all together they form that letter. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that amazing? And so it's the spirit of the living God who is at work and there is no um, it's not linked with the law of the Ten Commandments it is linked with this new order of this new covenant. Now literally as I said that will be done with Israel in the future the beginning of the millennium but for us it's already now with this understanding that it's not the law of the commandment that's written in our hearts it's Christ who is written on our hearts. So we are even closer to the Lord Jesus now as the people of Israel will be in the millennium. And so then in verse 3 again, one more point. Why it is the heart. See, from the heart are the issues of life. God is very much concerned about the condition of our heart. Very much concerned. And that's why God is also concerned if we harden ourselves, as believers we can harden ourselves, then there's a problem with the heart. And sometimes I like that saying, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And so if my heart condition is right with God, then God can work with me. But if my heart condition is not right with God, He has to deal with that first before He can use me. And so this is important. It is the tables of the heart. Because from the heart are the issues of life. The heart is like the center of our personality. If the heart is under God's control, then everything is, falls into place. Uh, it's like if you have a, an army, with, uh, the, the army base, or like the, the, um, the center of operation. The center of operation needs to be controlled by the general or whoever is in charge of that army. And from there the decisions are made. And so for our lives, the heart, our heart, there is where we make the decisions what we are going to do. That's why we make, uh, we need to have the right conditions so that we consider the things in God's light, that we are really in tune with God and though, then can go ahead with Him. Solomon said, from the heart are the issues of life. So that shows how important the condition of the heart is for God. And that is then worked out in verse 4 this confidence that Paul had uh, speaks about how he relied on the Lord but the word confidence also means um, boldness or it says in the King James trust this confidence implies that he put his trust in God through Christ and then he he uh, continues okay just one more thing about verse 4 such confidence we have through the Christ towards God so Paul is speaking about his ministry we have this confidence we put our trust in God but of course it's also a lesson for us the same way God wants us to put our trust in God and be in, in tune with the Lord Jesus the Christ the anointed one in heaven we need to be in tune with him so that he can use us as his instrument and then also towards God. See, God is involved in this. We are in the presence of God in this world. And so then Paul says in verse 5 that this 
ability, this competency or this sufficiency does not come from himself. It's not because he had such an amazing training. It's not because he's such a good orator. It's not because he has been sent there by a, a council of uh, apostles. No. This ability that he had, this competency, is not something that is evident from a human perspective. We see from other scriptures that Paul perhaps even had a problem to speak. Uh, we don't know exactly the details. But he was not a great orator, like Apollos was, for example. But the point is that what he could do, it was uh, not from him, but it came from God. And that is important for us too, that if God gives us a task, we have to realize that whatever we can do, we cannot do anything in our own strengths, but the ability, the sufficiency, the enablement comes from God. And the results are for God, not for our glory. That's a problem today. Many people want to do something for the Lord, but it is really for their own glory. That doesn't work. And Paul shows that very clearly. He was not doing these things for his own glory. But he was boasting in the fact, if I might use that term, that he was a minister. And now we come to that expression in verse 6 about the new covenant. He was made by God competent or sufficient to be minister. And the word minister in verse 6 um, really is the same word as deacon, diakonos. And so Paul and uh, those who were working with him there in Corinth, they were ministers. He uh, compares himself with the others who work, work with him. He, puts not, he doesn't put himself on a high pedestal above the others, but they're all together workers and, in that sense, ministers, deacons. That's the term that he uses. And it is of the new covenant. So... We have seen already earlier, literally, the new covenant will be made with Israel, as you know from Jeremiah 31. But why does Paul say then here in verse 6 that he and the other apostles were ministers of the new covenant? Because all the blessings connected with the new covenant that will come in the future for Israel on this earth, those blessings were already ministered by Paul and the other apostles in a spiritual way now. Okay? And that we also have to distinguish from the blessings you find, for example, in Ephesians, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. The blessings of the new covenant may cover part of those blessings also, but we should not mix them together. The blessings of the new covenant are uh, explained in Hebrews 8 and also in Jeremiah 31 and the spiritual aspect of those blessings are already now our portion okay that's why Paul says that he is a minister of the new covenant not to literally make that new covenant with the church some believe that God will make that new covenant with Israel in the days to come when they will be born again as a nation but the blessings of the new covenant Paul could already administer to the believers today through the Holy Spirit. It's a bit complicated, but I hope you get the point. And so I repeat one aspect, uh, one more time, that those blessings that Israel will have on earth, the spiritual side of these blessings are already ministered to the believers through Paul. And that is the great privilege that Paul uh, conveys to the believers that all these blessings that God will give in the millennium, in the world to come, the spiritual blessings, the spiritual aspect of these blessings are already for us today. Okay? But we are not under the same covenant as Israel. We are not the law written on our hearts. It's Christ written on our hearts. And so Paul was doing that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the living God, the spirit of the living God, he was writing Christ on the believer's heart. And so that is a ministry that goes on to today also. That God is writing through the Holy Spirit Christ on our hearts. And he uses difficulties, as we saw with Paul, 
He went through great difficulties so that God could prepare him to be an instrument fit for the Master's use. And so God is going to use all kinds of things, but it is in order to write Christ on the tablet of our heart. That's a great privilege. And then we see the contrast in verse 6. He says, we do not write with letter, with the letter that kills. So, it's not with letter, because the letter kills. That is the reference to the law of Moses that had this effect, that they, they didn't keep it, so they were killed under, under condemnation. And 3,000 people died on that day that uh, Moses came down from the mountain. But the new order that we're talking about is an order that's marked by life and by the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 6 at the end, the Spirit quickens. So the letter of the law written on stone will kill. But the new order of things, Christ written on the tablets of the heart, is done by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life. Quicken means he gives life. So where death is, the Spirit of God can produce life. If somebody gets saved today, it's like go from death to life. And the Holy Spirit gives that, has that life-giving power. He can use anything, can use a verse in Scripture to bring that life about. It's amazing how the Spirit of God can use any verse from the Bible because then He makes it living and powerful. And that is the Spirit that quickens. In John 6, uh, verse 63, the Lord Jesus says, The flesh doesn't profit anything. But he says the Spirit quickens. You find in John 5, the Father quickens. You find in John 5 also that the Son quickens. The Son of God is the one that gives life. And in John 6, you find that the Holy Spirit gives life. Isn't that amazing? The triune God. We're talking about the, the God, um, the, the living God. The three persons of God are involved in this quickening, in this life-giving. And then he uh, interrupts himself. You have to see from verse 7 to verse 16. That's a long passage, and in some translations it's uh, put between brackets. It is a parenthesis. Now, a parenthesis does not mean it's not important, but a parenthesis means it is a topic in itself, and so, if you go from verse 7 to verse uh, 16 at the end, it's a passage that belongs together. And then the thought that you had in verse 6, the letter kills but the spirit quickens, he continues then in verse 17, now the Lord is the spirit, but where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So this point of verse 6, that the spirit quickens, goes on in verse 17, that the Spirit is also, the Spirit is marked by liberty. Liberty does not mean a free-for-all, you just do what you please. That's not at all the thought. But this liberty means you're not under the um, yoke of the law, a harsh yoke, you're now put in liberty. But if you want to study more about that, I would like to uh, uh, advise you to read Galatians. In Galatians, you find how we now are under the law of Christ and that we are under a new yoke. The law of Christ doesn't mean that you can just do what you want. We are now under one yoke with Christ to please God, to please Him. And this is true liberty because then you do exactly, you want exactly to do what the Lord Jesus wants you to do. You do exactly what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. That is the law of liberty. And so that is Paul's exercise that we will be so close to God, so close to the Lord Jesus, that our thinking is synchronized with God's thinking as the word, that we think the same things as the Lord Jesus does. That is liberty. So we'll keep that for a moment when we come to verse 17. But now we can look at that parenthesis that starts at verse 7, where he gives more details about this ministry of death that was connected with the law of Moses the law that was grave, uh, written on stones and even that started with glory see in verse 7 
So there are some parallels between the old and new order, but there are also tremendous contrast. You've seen what was written on the tablet of stone is death. It led to death because they failed. But there is also a parallel, and that is here, it starts with glory. But then the difference is, yes, it started with glory, but it didn't continue in glory. Whereas the new covenant ministry that Paul is talking about here is really, it started with glory when the Holy Spirit came down in Acts 2, but it continues in glory because it is connected with Christ in heaven at God's right hand, who is there crowned with glory and honor. It's all marked by glory all the way through. And so you could see this new, you could say this, this new uh, covenant ministry that Paul is speaking about is really Christ written on the tablets of our heart that we are uh, in tune with God and that God can find his delight in us as well. That's what God wants. And so then he uh, works about these contrasts in verse 7 to 16. The Spirit of God is not writing on stones, but on our hearts, as we saw earlier. And when Moses introduced the old order, the old law, there was glory, but it says in verse 7, the children of Israel could not fix their eyes on the face of Moses on account of the glory of his face. It's a reference of what you find in uh, Exodus 34. When the golden calf had been destroyed, and God's judgment took place there in Exodus 32, then Moses went out of the camp with Joshua. And you see then that, they, that Moses put a tent of a meeting outside the camp, many lessons connected with that, and then he would go there with Joshua, and it says everyone who wanted to seek the Lord could go there, but only Joshua and Moses were there in the tent, and the Israelites stood at the entrance of their tent and they were looking at Moses when he went there. And when Moses came back after he had spoken to the Lord, then there was so much uh, radiancy on his face that people were scared and Moses put a veil on his face. You can read that in Exodus 33 and 34. And so that is the point now. It started with glory, but it could not continue in glory. And we talked, we'll talk about the veil in a few moments when we get there. But in contrast to that passing glory, that glory that will pass, now the ministry of the Holy Spirit in verse 8, the ministry of the Holy Spirit subsists or continues in glory. That is verse 8. And that's also in our day. In the King James it says, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? It continues in glory. That is connected with Christ in the glory and the ministry of the Holy Spirit working and he is not only the writer, he is also the speaker. Because in verse 9, the ministry of condemnation was glory, but much rather the ministry of righteousness abounds in glory. So, when you think of these stars, when you see them at night, beautiful, twinkling stars, but when the sun comes up the next morning, you don't see those stars anymore. And so you could say the, this old order, this beauty, this glory there, it dissipates, it disappears when the sun comes up. The sun of righteousness, speaking of the Lord Jesus, and that is the ministry of righteousness that abounds in glory. Verse 9. It is a tremendous contrast. There are parallels, glory, like the stars, but there are also contrast because the glory of the sun is much stronger than the glory in the background of those stars that you don't see then when the sun shines. So again, I said there are parallels and contrast. And then in verse 10, for also that which was glorified is not glorified in this respect on account of the surpassing glory. These are difficult verses, but if you understand that concept, uh, the temporary glory had to disappear. And we'll see a, more, a few more details about that in the coming verses. Verse 11, for if that annulled was introduced with glory, so that was annulled, that means 
that had to be uh, set aside, a note really means rendered inoperative. This whole law system was not, had not any effect. It didn't result in anything. It only caused death. And so it was rendered inoperative because of man's failure. But with the new covenant, everything is Christ, as we saw earlier, and God can bless now because God is satisfied. What God demanded under the law of Moses, people did not halt. They, they failed. And so God had to come in in judgment. But now with this new order of things, God can bless because all the demands that God has were maintained by the Lord Jesus. If God said whatever he asked in the law, the people failed, but the Lord Jesus never failed. And not only that, the work on the cross that he accomplished laid the foundation that God could be satisfied so that God could bless us because all the demands of God have been held by the Lord Jesus. Has, God has been glorified by the work that Christ has done. And so now God can bless. And the abundant blessings that we have today is the result of that work of Christ, that God is satisfied. And so now this glory continues. And so that is connected with verse 12, having therefore such hope. Because we are in this world, everything is under the mark of death, under the uh, consequences of sin. But we are not connected with this order, we are connected with this new order of glory, but we have not reached the end goal yet. We are still in this world. We are still affected by sin. We have the sin nature in us, sin around us, and so we are still in difficult situations, as we saw earlier in Paul's own life. But we have hope, and this hope is certain. And this hope is very important, because that hope gives boldness. That's what you see in verse 12. Plainness of speech, uh, Paul says, but the literal word there for plainness is boldness or liberty. That boldness that Paul could use is because he had confidence. God was at work now through his ministry, and that confidence that Paul had, that boldness, he continued on. Find it in Hebrews also in several expressions. We have boldness to come before the throne of grace. We have boldness to enter the, the, holy, the holy place. That same boldness we find here with Paul now in verse 12. This plainness of speech implies also confidence in God. And so then you find the contrast. In verse 13 he says, not as Moses. Moses put a veil on his own face. I said that earlier. When Moses came back from God's presence, his face was full of radiancy. And people got scared. They could not fix their eyes on Moses. And Moses covered his face. That is the veil of verse 13. But then, and that, you really have to follow Paul's arguments, that veil that was a literal veil on Moses' face is now compared with the veil in verse 14. The veil that is on Israel when they read the law. Their thoughts have been darkened for unto this day the same veil remains in reading the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. When they read the Bible that speaks so clearly of Christ from Genesis 1 to Revelation, it's all Christ. It's very clear. But they cannot see that because they have this veil on their mind. It's, uh, their thoughts are veiled and that's especially strong in Judaism, but also in circles where people are put under the law or where people are under a veil. They are kept under a veil. They cannot see. And that is also, of course, true for the natural man. The natural man cannot see the thoughts of God. He has a veil on his face, on his heart. That's the hardening of the human heart. But that hardening is taken away. We'll see that in a moment. But why did God allow that, that that veil would be on their hearts, on their minds, on their eyes, so that 
they could not fix their eyes on the end of that note. That means on the end of that was going to be uh, rendered inoperative. So the law uh, leads to Christ, but the law as a system of things will be rendered inoperative when God introduces this new order of things. And that's what God has done in the Day of Grace. God has introduced Christ. He's written Christ on our hearts. And He speaks to us in grace from heaven through the Holy Spirit. God is the great communicator. And why does God communicate? Because He wants a response from our hearts. And so there's this contrast in the Old Testament. Their hearts, their thoughts were darkened. There was a veil and so they couldn't see. But that veil is taken away in Christ. It is rendered unoperative in Christ. How? You'll see that in a moment. Verse 15. And to this day when Moses read, the veil lies upon their heart. So that is that second veil. The little veil was on Moses' face. This symbolic veil is on their heart. God allows that. He gives him, has allowed in his government that their hearts are hardened because they have rejected the Messiah. That's the point. They have rejected the Messiah so they cannot understand. It is a, takes a great miracle for a Jew to become a believer. Of course, it's a, it takes a great miracle for everyone. Each, uh, each salvation is a great miracle. Just like every baby that's born is a great miracle. And so every one who comes, turns to God is a great miracle. But it's even a greater miracle in that sense, if I use that uh, analogy, if a Jew who is under this cover comes to the light, that all of a sudden he sees through that veil and he sees Christ. And, that, and that's why it says that veil is annulled in Christ. To the moment when he comes to the Messiah, when he comes to see the Lord Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, then that veil is taken away through the Holy Spirit. And so then it says in verse 15 that that veil is upon their heart. So that's the same veil of verse 14 is now on their heart. But then verse 16 says, when it, so that's a reference to Israel in the future, as I said earlier, when uh, the Spirit of God will write on them, when they will see the Messiah, you can compare it with Isaiah 53, their confession, when they will see the Lord Jesus come from heaven, and then they welcome him that's tremendous change that is a tremendous uh, turn now they reject him but then they will accept him the Lord Jesus himself says in Matthew 23, 39 you will not see me until you will say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord so that is still future but it is going to happen and that when it is happening is the veil is taken away and then it's a note. But in the meantime, the veil lies on their heart. Mm -hmm. But when they turn to the Lord, then that veil is taken away. So you have three veils. The little veil on Moses' face. You have the veil in God's government that remains on their hearts. So they cannot see but then the veil on their heart will be taken away the moment they turn to the Lord. And that's true for everyone who turns to God today. That moment God takes the veil, the hindrance, the cover that is there, He takes it away. Now He continues, from verse 17 on, He continues where He left us in verse 6, at the end of verse 6, the Spirit quickens. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is so important. It's the Spirit of the living God. And now he says in verse 17, The Lord is the Spirit. And this is very complicated, but we see how, if we want to be understand that the two go together, it's not complicated. The Lord in heaven, crowned with glory and honor, he has set the Holy Spirit. Imagine, a man in the glory, the Lord Jesus, as a man in the glory, he has sent the Holy Spirit. You find in John's Gospel that the Holy Spirit will come on its own initiative because he's a divine person. The Father would send the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus, the Son, would send the Holy Spirit. But it's also true that the glorified man in heaven would send the Holy Spirit. And that is why there is no conflict. The Lord 
takes away that veil? The Lord is the Spirit. Because the Lord identifies with the Spirit and the Spirit of God is completely in tune with the Lord Jesus as He is now in heaven. So what the Holy Spirit does here on this earth right now, He represents Christ in heaven. And He works on behalf of Christ in heaven. And that is when, while there is that's why there is liberty. And we talk briefly about that liberty in Galatians. In James, Gospel, in James uh, you find it is the law of liberty, the royal law. This uh, liberty that God gives is not something that uh, has anything to do with the liberty of the flesh. Not at all. It is the liberty that God gives in, to the believer to be in a position so that he can enjoy that fellowship. And that is why in verse 7, 18 it continues this liberty why is that so important we all looking on the glory of the Lord if you are in bondage if you are suffering uh, because of sin if you are held by bonds you don't have the liberty to look up to the Lord in the glory but if you are set free as you find here by the spirit of God by the spirit that quickens then you can join Paul and say with him, we all, that is for all of us, set free to look up to the Lord in the glory. That's a tremendous privilege. And dear friends, we cannot do anything no. without his help. We need to rely on him. Mm-hmm. When Stephen was killed, was stoned to death in Acts 7, what did Stephen say? I see Jesus, I see the heavens open, and Jesus at the right hand of God. He had this free access. He had this liberty to see the Lord Jesus there at God's right hand. And at the same time, he was sustained by the Lord. The Lord in heaven was sustaining Stephen while the stones rained on his body. And that is the point here. The Lord in heaven, he is connected to the believers on this earth, And so this is the privilege that we have here. We can look up to the Lord in glory, with unveiled face, and He will take care of us. And then He is going to do something. We are being transformed according to the same image, from glory to glory. Now in nature we have an illustration of that. If you have a butterfly, a beautiful butterfly, it doesn't start like that. It comes from a, from a little, uh, okay. how do you call that? Caterpillar. caterpillar, thank you. So the caterpillar eats from a certain leaf. It has to be a specific leaf. And eats and eats. And all of a sudden it's turned into a pupa. And then on a sunny day, out of the pupa comes a butterfly. That is transformation. And that's the word used here. Literally, metamorphosis. Meta is a radical change. Morphosis is form. So the form is changed. So that happens with us when we look up to the Lord Jesus. Stephen did not complain that they were stoning him. He is so thrilled that he can see the Lord in the glory. And he only thinks of the Lord in the glory. And that's the transformation that takes place in Stephen. And that's the transformation that took place in Paul's life. You remember earlier I said that Paul was in great heaven, is in great difficulty. But God used those difficulties to change him. And that transformation that you're talking about here in verse 18, that is something that God wants to work in all of us, according to the same image. So the Lord is now in, in heaven. And he wants us to be in tune with the Lord in the glory so that we are changed from glory to glory. And that amazing privilege. But we need to surrender. We need to be willing that the Lord can take over. That the Lord can have full sway. And then we are transformed from glory to glory according to the same image. Image means the Lord Jesus represents God. He is God, but as a man in heaven, he represents God. That's the word image. And then he will change us from glory to glory. The glory that you find in his face, 
reflect on us and from us it goes back to him it's the same as worship God has shed abroad his love into our hearts and it's in our hearts and it goes back to God in worship as you find already in John 4 with this Samaritan woman and this is what we find here from glory to glory so God puts something in our hearts from the Lord Jesus and it goes back to him in worship and it is through a work of the Lord Jesus as I said earlier he is in heaven Lord it is through the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus they work together and so think of that right now the Lord Jesus is working from heaven working in us through the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is at work and he brings us back to the Lord Jesus in heaven he shows how great he is and then we are worshippers we are satisfied we are happy when you think of him in his glory in his greatness how wonderful so then later on he will work out more details about this transformation and about this ministry but we'll stop for now and in chapter 4 we'll find more details about uh, what this ministry is all about but we cannot do that in one setting you would read chapter 3, 4, 5 together to have this uh, overview of the ministry of the new covenant that Paul had and that is what God is doing while we are in this scene of difficulty and trials chapter 6 also is included in that God is at work and he wants to produce something of Christ in us for his own glory and he needs all the believers together of the whole world from Acts 2 to the rapture they're all included in that work and finally when the Lord Jesus will come perhaps today we don't know when he will come then that will be achieved that will be finished completed but in the meantime this process goes on all the time so if there are questions or comments perhaps you can take a few moments well, I was thinking of this veil so for the Israelites it was like there was two veils and not one one is over their heart and one was in the temple yeah the veil in the temple uh, implied that they could not ex they didn't have access to God but when Christ died on the cross it was that a... veil was rent mm -hmm. but this other veil is still over their heart that's the point that's the point and so they still cannot see no because their hearts are veiled yeah. mm -hmm. so although the veil is rent it's free access they cannot see that it's, it's very sad but they don't see it they, they kept on going on with that service in the temple for 40 years although the veil was rent they kept going yeah. so that shows this blindness or this hardness of heart I believe they're still using a veil in the synagogues and they pray to men so the veil in the context that we have seen is the veil that was on Moses' face so that's a little veil that we just said also it means there is separation it means you yeah. don't have the same uh, communion but then the second veil is on the heart and that veil as we've seen tonight is only taken away when they turn to the Lord then that hardness will be taken away because the hardening is also a veil so mentally there's a veil they cannot understand what the law says but there's also a veil on their hearts as we saw earlier and that will be taken away when they turn to the Lord so this would be one of the reasons why the Gentiles were easily converted they didn't have that veil because they had not hardened themselves in the same way because what happened with the Jewish people they had seen the Messiah in Hebrews 2 Paul explains that or the writer of uh, Hebrews explains that that all these miracles had been taken place among them uh, yeah. Peter in Acts 2 explains that God had given those miracles to show that this was indeed the Messiah yes. and yet they rejected him so that is uh, that veil is connected with their hardening and that still is there today they had rejected him then and they still reject him except for a remnant God is always a remnant in Romans 11 Paul explains that he belonged to that remnant that's the exception but in general that veil is still there
Could we say that the, it's only saved people that have fleshy tables of the heart? Yeah. yeah. Paul spends a lot of time on these details, which may seem going into more detail than necessary, but I wondered if there was always, one of the dangers was the law being, like, uh, influences, like you said, corrupt, corrupt drop doctrine, the law in this case coming in as being necessary. And so this was getting to the root, the fleshy tables. That it's, it's not the outward so much as the inward. I'm not sure if I uh, get your point, but can you repeat it in other words? Well, you mentioned before about wrong. There was always the, the danger of corruption coming in. Yeah. Doctrine, I'm talking about. Yeah. Influences. And just the thought that this gets at the root of the matter. Mm -hmm. That's right. The heart. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were, they, even when he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians, they had gift, tremendous gift, from mm -hmm. what we understand. Yeah. But they were still acting like children. Mm -hmm. So maturity is necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, there are many issues. So if we talk about the veil, we talk about the hardening of their hearts, and then you talk about the condition of the Corinthians. They were had, had become believers, and still there was a form of hardening, a lack of maturity. Uh, so that's another problem. So despite the essential problem that you're talking about, about that veil, there were other problems among the Corinthians. And we have seen that in the, when we, we went to the first epistle. And so that is also for us important. If there is a lack of maturity, we cannot appreciate really who Christ is. Because we are too much focused on ourselves. And so with Israel, they are focused on themselves because they think they are all right. And when you are a young believer and immature and you don't grow, then you have a problem also, but it's not the same problem, that's what I'm trying to say. There is a similarity, but it's also different. I don't know if you see my point. When a Jew believes today, is he not accepting the new covenant? If a Jew becomes a believer, he accepts what Paul explains here as the minister of the new covenant. Yeah, he accepts that then. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's the case, are we not all under the new covenant? Yeah, but, not, believers? Yeah, yeah. but not in a formal way. The covenant will be made formally with Israel in the future. Yeah, I understand that yeah. in the future. Yeah. But I'm talking with the present. Okay. The present we are under the benefits, we are under the blessings of the new covenant but not formally under the new government. That's the difference. Paul is a well, minister of... Well, i the word formally. <laughs> so, uh, it is the official... The Mr. Darby didn't believe that. that official. It is not an official order of saying that we are under the new government. That's what I'm trying to say. Not in an official way. But we have the blessings of the new government. As we saw here, Paul is a minister of the new government. So we have the blessings. <laughs> That's the point. Um, Ah, but Galatians um, chapter 6, uh, a few verses at the end of the sin to be more than that point. Yeah. Verse, Galatians 6 and 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. Yeah. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. That's a very important scripture. Hmm. Uh, and so what we find here in Galatians 6 is, we belong now to the new creation or a new creature, the King James said, but it's really a new creation. The new creation is what we are now for God, for God's pleasure. We already belong to that new creation, the moment right. we get saved. And Jeremiah speaks of the same thing, does it not? Of a new creation, a new heart. Yes, mm -hmm. but what I'm trying to say is this, that there are parallels, but we are not 
under that order in a formal way as Israel will be under the new covenant in the world to come. That is where I make a difference. But we have the blessings that will come with the new covenant already now. And that's why you need to be born again in order to receive those blessings. Mm -hmm. But also what you mentioned earlier in that verse, uh, in verse 16, there's a new rule. Many as walk according to this rule, that is this new rule that goes together with the new creation, that new rule is under which we are placed now in connect with peace and mercy, and that is already uh, for Israel of God. That means the true believers of Israel, they belong to that Israel of God already now. They don't have to wait till the world to come, to the millennium. They belong already to the Israel of God now. So that is to encourage the believers from among Israel that they had this blessing, the blessings that are future for Israel, they have these blessings already now. And we also have these blessings, that was my point. Well, this, this, this chapter also speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to bring us into the new yes. covenant, is it not? Yes. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is essential. Yeah. And we've seen that tonight. Without the Holy Spirit, we have nothing. Yeah. And we have the earnest of that spirit. And the earnest means two things. Yeah. The, the guarantee that we will get the fullness of these blessings in the future, but also a preview or a foretaste already now through the Holy Spirit who is in us. We anticipate these things already now, but we cannot fully grasp them yet because we are limited. But at the same time, He will never leave us. Absolutely. And so we will be in uh, in with with Christ yeah. forever. It's the guarantee this this uh, what we saw in uh, Second Corinthians in the beginning in chapter one is the guarantee that we will get there. Yes. We're still in this body on this earth with all our failures, yes. but it is a guarantee. The fact that the Holy Spirit is in us is the guarantee that we will get there. Yes. In the meantime, we may already enjoy these blessings. In a limited way, of course. That's right. One more question. What is the spirit, spiritual condition of men like David? Okay, David in the Old Testament uh, was a believer, but he did not belong to this new order of things that we're talking about. He belonged to the old well, he order. He belonged to the church, of course. Yeah, yeah. So he belonged to the friends of the bridegroom, like John the Baptist represents the Old Testament believers. And he calls himself a friend of the bridegroom. In that sense, David was also a friend of the bridegroom. And when the wedding will take place in Revelation 19, the wedding between the Lord Jesus and the church, then they will be the guests, perhaps the guest of honor. <laughs> but they will be the guests. They will attend that wedding. When you have the wedding with the Lord Jesus, they will be the guests. So they are blessed also, but not the same blessing that we have. But they are blessed, certainly. Don't we find in the Old Testament that Israel was God's wife. Yes. Yes. But that's Jehovah. Jehovah and yes. Israel. Yes. The relationship between Jehovah and Israel is the relationship between Jehovah as bridegroom yes. and uh, also um, husband. Yes. This connection with Israel. But Israel has become unfaithful. That God will restore them and they will take them back. Well, what we have in the New Testament in, in, in Corinthians itself, it says, I have espoused you unto Christ. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's for the church. Present you as a chaste virgin unto yeah. Christ. That's for us today. Yes. Yeah. So Paul's ministry was designed to prepare the church for the Lord Jesus and to keep them as a a chaste virgin in this world. So is there then between the Old Testament and New Testament uh, children of Israel if there is a Christian in the New Testament is there a different position yeah. than there is for the Old Testament? Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's the point. It's not the same position. Yeah. There are 
privileges that we all have, blessings that we all have, but there is a difference. As I said, John the Baptist or the Old Testament believers will be the guests of the wedding, but we will belong to the bride. And the Lord Jesus wants us to get ready for that wedding. He wants us to prepare the wedding garment. Yes. Revelation 19, you see that. And so our, the work we do, the activities we do for the Lord is getting ready, getting that garment ready. Okay? The Lord's at work. He wants to use all the believers, as I said earlier, to get ready for the wedding. And that was Paul's ministry, as a, uh, to keep him as a chaste virgin to get him ready for the wedding. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of confusing at times when you read things like in Ephesians where it says Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition. Yeah, but not only that. It also the fact that we are already the wife in Ephesians 5. Yeah. So and and the the, the, the wedding is still future. So I, it is, these are um, symbolic is symbolic language to help understand the relationship. We are in a sense already the wife of Christ, mm -hmm. connected with Him as a wife and a husband and a wife. At the same time, literally. The wedding is still future, as we've said yes. earlier in Revelation 19. Mm -hmm. So it, we have to be very careful how we express ourselves and how we apply these examples, but we are so privileged, yes. dear friends, that we are already the wife of the Lord Jesus, Ephesians 5, that He cares for us as a husband cares for his wife. Yes. At the same time, we have the responsibility, as you saw earlier, while we are in this world, to prepare ourselves for the wedding, which is still future, yes. Revelation 19. Mm -hmm. It's a bit complicated, and it is even more complicated when you study the rest of the Bible, because yes. then you see in Revelation uh, 19 that this bride mm -hmm. will, is preparing herself for that wedding. Yes. When you go to the eternal state, she's still seen as a bride. Yes. So she is married, and in the eternal state she's seen as a bride. Because the spirit and the bride say, come. Yeah. yeah. But that the bride is there to emphasize, he, he, she is the one that represents the bridegroom. He shows off, as we may use the term, his bride. He's so proud to, this is my bride, look. And so this, this um, purity, this uh, reality of a, of a bride, will always be there. The Holy Spirit will maintain that, that purity, that, uh, that beautiful aspect. He will maintain that. In that sense, the church will be a bride forever. The Holy Spirit will work that. So that you can that you remain a bride, like in our lives. That's not the same, of course, because you get older. But the bride <laughs> that you have... <laughs> the bride that you have in Revelation... It never gets old. And that's why we keep pictures around, our wedding mm. pictures. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I was wondering if you could say a little more on the heart. I was yeah. thinking of Ephesus, they left their first love. And then a number of times in Hebrews he says, Today if you will hear his voice, harden up your hearts. Yeah. And somewhere else it says, Hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so maybe you could say a little more on how to keep our hearts open and soft to judge ourselves constantly in God's presence. We need to judge what's of the flesh. And if we do that, then our hearts will be in tune with the Lord Jesus. But when we harden ourselves, we should not harden ourselves, but when we do that, then we create a distance between Him and us. And the enemy is going to use that distance to further harden our hearts. And so this is really a critical matter so that we may cultivate this relationship with the Lord Jesus through this purity that we're talking about, through dependence on Him, through the work of the Holy Spirit, it is, it's all these elements go together. You can separate, you can distinguish the different aspects, but you can separate the one from the other. Mm -hmm. But what you mentioned is a very good point to consider. And that means we are all greatly privileged, but at the same time, great challenges, because the Lord wants us to keep that relationship intact. And the flesh in us is uh, working against that. And the enemy is also working against it. So it's ongoing work. 